Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> All right, folks, we asked on our respective YouTube channels for you to hit us with some questions for our up and coming Q&A. So here we are, sitting in temperatures between minus two and minus six. It's actually warmed up a bit because the clouds have came over slightly. Frozen water. <laughs> <laughs> Frozen whiskey. Mm. So anyways, we have got all the questions cleared. Between the two of us, we've got just under 17,000 subscribers and we managed to muster up, what was it, about 60 questions? Yeah, something like this. Yeah. Quite a lot, quite a lot. A lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, I'll kick <laughs> off then. So, James from Scottish Munro Journey asked, Do you guys think that filming your adventures positively or negatively impacts your hiking and camping experience? Now, just before we go on, Stripey, somebody else actually asked us, or very similar this morning. I don't have his name, but we'll, we'll put it up on the screen. But very similar questions anyway. So, okay. do you want to kick off with your answer? From my point of view, not really, no. It's, um, for me, it's a hobby, it's not my job. Um, and I'm not filming all the tours which I'm doing. And when I film something, then I really want to film it. And when I feel not like filming, then I'm just not filming. So it has not a negative impact. And the positive impact, I don't know, it's just a hobby. Yeah, I'm not sure if this is positive or not. I just enjoy doing it and yeah, yeah. that's it. I mean, for me, the the YouTube filming side of the things, it's a byproduct. Like, the right. number one goal has been out and then YouTube comes second. I mm. feel if I film too much, it does eat into my enjoyment. But I do still enjoy filming, but it's just getting that balance. Yeah, for me it was, I started just with photography and now I do just video clips and less photography, but it's, as you said, a byproduct of, the, of my yeah, hobby. Exactly. Yeah, and when I don't feel it, then I'm just not doing it, but I would never let it ruin my hobby. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know about it. you, but see when I'm actually editing a night or two after, it's, it's good to relive it all. Ah, there's nice. little bits you forgot and you're like, oh, I'll keep that in. Nice memories. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I think ultimately, when I'm old and decrepit, I'll go back and watch these videos, like the uh -huh. Cape Raft Trail and things like that. I mean, for me, it was also, it was at the beginning, it was really just to share my little adventures with my friends back in Canada or in Germany. Yeah, I yeah. never thought that someone else would watch it, yeah, I so... I think not every so. YouTuber starts out like that, it's just, just for memories and then you sort of pick up a bit of pace and you, mm. you get more and more viewers. Okay, Robin, Corinna asks, um, hopefully the weather improves for the weekend for you both. Yes, it did. Thank you very much, yep. Corinna. Super boss. Um, What's your best Monroe walk and experience? What's my best Monroe walk and experience? Aye. Uh, for me, it'd probably be Fisherfield. Absolutely stunning in there. Haven't been there, I don't know. Have you not? <laughs> Get there next year. I think there's no such thing as wilderness in Britain, but for me, Fisherfield is what it gets pretty close mm. to it. Yeah, they wanted to go with Sam, but it didn't work out with weather-wise, yeah. but... Um, you just can't get much more remote. So yeah, Fisherfield. Okay. Yeah, I'm not so much with Monroes or Begging, but um, for me, my best walk, which I did was before I was actually filming anything, was, I think, the Ring of Steel, because I met Sam, and with Sam I'm still going out doing squambles and all the tours, so I would say the Ring of Steel for me. It's a good one, by the way. It's really nice. Yeah. Okay, so moving on, Alistair asked, by the way, he bought us two, he bought us a coffee each on my buy me a coffee. So thanks very much, Alistair. Thank you very much. For chipping in with a couple of coffees there. But anyways, he was asking, what was your scariest moments by yourselves and have you changed your mindset since then? Stripey. Difficult to pick one, <coughs> but it was like... The 18th of December in 2007, I went on the 18th of December, like onto the Chesa Plana, which is a mountain in Montafon for Alberg, with like um, 2,964 meters. So I went there over, yeah, and then I went over a glacier, and I need to go down a Via Ferrata, but most Via Ferratas don't have any ropes. Yeah, they, they pull the ropes and the people don't go down. Um, but I needed to go to work on Monday, it was a Sunday, so I couldn't yeah. turn back, it was too long, the trip. And I walked down, it looked fair. And by the Leibersteig is like a wall, like 500 meters, like vertical. 
and snow came we had like I was with a friend like knee deep or so snow um, I slipped not slipped I crumbled not I was sliding down maybe it was just like 10 centimeters yeah or five centimeters but it felt like an yeah. awful long way and I saw myself already in this third person um, I never experienced this before in my life that I see myself I saw myself falling already Right, yeah, weird. it was like absolute um, and afterwards I wasn't going in the mountains for like six months. Really? Uh, it yeah. took me ages to get back to it because, it scale. yeah, just like, even now I have a shiver when I think of it. Um, what did I change? <clears throat> um, what did I change? I just think I learned not a lot, I'm honest, yeah. I, I put crampons earlier on, yeah, and um, I wouldn't go down the Via Ferrata without the steel rope anymore. Mm. And I would think that work is not as important, that I would risk anything. But in this moment, I was younger, yeah? it was like, oh, I need to be at work. Otherwise, I can't do it. I, I can't be a day off. Yeah, I thought the word wouldn't turn without me. <laughs> I'd, uh, yes, time off work, I'm injured. <laughs> For me, um, now you did say scariest moments by yourselves. Most incidents I've had, I've been with somebody as well, um, and there was one in the Memoirs. Hmm. Uh, me and my friend Phil went out and did, uh, it was near the ones you camped on, uh, Nagrukin and Stopbinin, I want to say. Mm -hmm. Stopbinin, yeah, yeah, and I think that's the highest in the range. The rich one, aye, yeah. Benmore is the highest. So. And we got to Nagrukin, I think is how you pronounce it, and we went across the ridge and there was just this little snowrette, and we were in the mist, and it looked pretty spicy for me. I was a novice. Was, this is back in 2011. I'd only just sort of cut my teeth into winter hiking. And luckily we had a guy called Dave who'd done quite a bit in the Alps. He was a wee bit more experienced and he went, don't worry, just walk over the top of it. So gingerly walked over the top of this snowrette. I mean, if you walked that route in summer, you'd probably wouldn't think of anything. Yeah, I did it in summer. Yeah. It was fine. Yeah, but, but yeah, winter is everything the, different. Because yeah. it was winter and the mist was swollen, we couldn't see what the drop was like or anything mm. like that. So that, that was pretty dodgy, but we got to um, the second Monroe, which is, I want to say, Stobinian. Mm -hmm. And um, you're meant to retrace your steps and go back down to those lock-ins that you camped at. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, I had it in my head, you headed directly off the summit. And I remember, <laughs> I know, exactly. <laughs> Luckily, Dave's phone, leather phone cover for his uh, Apple, dropped and it rolled down the gully and I'm just thinking, nah. There's no way we're going down there. It's gone. Yeah, it's gone. And there's no way we can go down there. So we got the map out and right, right. I think we, head, we headed down the north and it was it was quite benign. And then there was this protruding rock and I thought, for some reason I just thought, I'm going to bum slide around this rock. I don't know why. And of course I started sliding towards this gully. And my ice axe was not in my hand and it was like disappearing. And I managed just to outreach, grab the axe and stop myself. And again, it was like you, I only went maybe couple of feet if you're lucky. I don't know how far it was but it felt like Yeah, it felt enough. a lot more. But it gave me a fright and I just remember Dave shouted you're right and I just burst out laughing. So that was a bit of a scare. And somebody had quite a nasty accident on the same mountain a week or two before and that was praying in my mind. But then my friend Phil, we got past that but we were on a nice ridge, we could see Ben Nevis, everything was fine. And then, you know when you're like going down a ridge and you just sort of stops. Mm -hmm. We got to that end and it was really steep. It was just like littered with boulders. So Dave was like, hey, you want to turn and face rock, just kick steps, walk your way down. At this point I was shaking with fear and hunger and like feeling pretty weak. Phil was right above me, like three, four feet above me and I thought if he goes, his crampons are going straight in my head and taking me with him. So I was like, Phil, go and go over that way. So he's like, aye, okay. And then he slipped and fell and Dave, he was quite efficient, he got down quite quite a bit before us and he was like I thought Phil was going out in a body bag but he just managed to stop his arrest his fall oh. so uh, and he hurt his knee and all that I had to give him ibuprofen it was, it was a bit of an epic so the, what is your change so what, it, my change, what is your learning <laughs> to be it's changed a lot but not intentionally it's just that really clipped my wings and now I tend to do more sort of benign routes in winter because I just I think if you're just new to it, don't try and bite off more than you can chew, that would be my advice. And be not being afraid to turn around and acknowledge it. As a, I think it's, it's not a weakness to turn around, it's a, it's a positive thing when you turn yeah. around and say, instead of trying it like, oh, exactly. I, I'm so cool, I can do it, yeah? <laughs> it's like, no, you're not. And I always say, 
true mountaineers know when to turn back and there's some truth in that I suppose. Okay, um, Alex asks, favourite multi-day begging routes you have done? Can I answer for you? Yep. Yeah, your fisher field. No, 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 <laughs> no. no. That'd, be, that'd be too easy. Uh, <laughs> I think with fisher field, they come as a, a five and you have to sort of do them in one trip anyway. So for multi-bagging, it would be the Fanix 9. Okay. That was, that was fantastic. You can do it in a long day, but me, Stevie and Kev broke up in a wild camp. And um, it's got a nice long grassy ridge for the first, I want to say seven. Yeah, it's the last two at the end you have to drop right down for. But it's a cracking route. Well, but you're not really a, a multi-bagger as such, are you? <laughs> no, I haven't really done any multi-day um, hikes yet. Um, why? There comes a um, question later to it. Um, but it's... I did only the Cairn Gorms, which was like 72 hours, where I walked around 100 kilometers. But a part of that, I haven't done really um, multi-day things, so I don't have one yet. Okay, dokes. So moving on, Malice GLA said, Hi Robin, I'd be interested in what is your and Stripey's single favourite item for hiking stroke wild camping? All of them? No, I only I single item, yeah. It's difficult because everything's got a purpose, hasn't it? I, everything has a, yeah. usually a double purpose even, yeah. Um, but I really do like my watch. I have a Garmin watch, like a GPS watch, because I just like the numbers and I like to look at the GPS track and things. And I wear it also every day. Yeah, so this is probably the most used item I have and probably my, yeah, probably my favorite. Or, or tracking poles, I'm not sure. Very I always use tracking poles like till I was, I don't know, the last 16 years or so. Do you know when I first started that, I used to slag off people with tracking poles? But I wouldn't be seen without them now. Yeah, you don't do this in the Alps. This is probably a British thing. You think it's only for old people or so. Exactly. And I was only in my mid-twenties at the time. And now I'm in my <laughs> early forties. My <laughs> knees are creaking. I'm like, yeah, I need poles. Okay. No, poles are, poles are good. No, they are good. And like, they put tents up, river crossings. So, um, what is yours? Favorite? Oh, it's mine, yeah, before we move on. Tents. I love tents. I can't pick a particular one, but... I just see tents and, you know, I could have a massive collection if I wanted to. So your favourite single item for hiking and wild camping is tents? Just tents, I. Okay. <coughs> it makes wild camping possible, doesn't it? Okay, Gordy, get out. Um, since you have been doing this hiking, um, camping, Malaki, what's been your worst experience? What's been my worst experience? Camping next to a germ. <laughs> <laughs> nah, you're alright, mate. Uh, what's your worst experience? I suppose this isn't scary experience, this is just... Um, it's weird because I've never not enjoyed a walk, but there's been some days it's just been getting your head down, you know, the clouds. You're mm. in the cloud, it's cold, it's windy, you're just not enjoying it. It's like you're, you're going into that sort of type 2 territory, of, for, or type 2 fun. Um, I can't pick out a single one, but yeah, just the days where you're... You're stuck in the mist and the rain, and you're basically just going out to bag a new Monroe or Corbett. What about yourself? Yeah, it's not really a mountain camp, but I was with a, with a church when I was younger, um, camping in the Ardèche Valley in France, and I woke up on my inflatable ESA mattress because the whole tent was flooded. It was like 20 centimeters of water or so. It was just running through, it was like a stream. Huh? I mean, if you were on YouTube, how many views would that have got? I wouldn't, I, 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 there are questions. Eh? I just imagine no, the but title, this was the worst flooded tent, that'd be it. Half yeah. a million views. Right, so Steve is asking, who would you like to share a wild camp with who you've never been with before or met? I, I'm genuinely not too good with people, I think. I'm, I'm pretty happy with myself and I would not like to camp with people I don't know, so actually um, no one. Come on, pick someone. <laughs> no, it's, it's really, it's not my, there are a lot of interesting people, yeah. Um, obviously, I was reading about it um, at home. I read the questions on, on your box, yeah. Yeah. Well, what is popping up? That I'm not completely um, blind when I come here. If I would need to pick one, maybe Alexander Huber from the Huber Brothers, which are yeah, like climber mountaineers. They do a lot of in the Dolomites. But 
there are other people I think which are, I would love to camp with Bill Gates or so. I think he's really interesting to listen to, I think. But That's a bit left of field. I know, I know. <laughs> this is the reason why I said rather no. There is no, I'm, I'm not the type of person. Yeah, you. Yeah, there's me. Um, when I seen this question come through, the first person I thought of was Chris Townsend. You know, the guy's, he's getting on a bit now, but he's seen and done everything. He's hiked across the world and he must have a lot of stories. He's spent more nights under canvas than I've had hot dinners. Hmm. You know, the guy, okay. I just think he'd be a knowledge sponge and he's still, I think he's late 70s, and you know, he's still writing for the TGO with gear reviews and all that. Yeah, um, that's great. Yeah. So yeah, Chris Townsend. Boardman Outdoors asks, um, does Stripey ever wish he had called himself Stripey Sock Guy, at least just for the summer months? It's not got the same ring to it, has it? Pardon? It's not got the same ring, Stripey, stripey Sock Guy. Just doesn't he roll off the tongue. Um, the Stripey hat was before the Stripey Socks, and yeah, I'm not wearing in summer all the time um, my Stripey hat. Obviously, I have also a sun hat, um, and no. I would not wish that I called myself differently. <laughs> okay, Fellman Dave, he asked, uh, do you both do any training and prep for your trips? Many of them are hard because Robin, don't think we haven't noticed those guns. <laughs> I don't do any training. Uh, you tend to lose your hiking legs over winter because you don't do as much. And then you build them up over spring and then by summer you, you feel like you've got your health fitness back. So. No, I don't do any training at all. What about you? <laughs> no, I'm sitting no. <laughs> all day in front of a computer during the week. Um, no, so I bad. should do some training, but no, I, I'm not doing um, any training. Geez, so, so cold. Mm. And I need more water, I guess. Okay. This whiskey is going down too easy. <laughs> it's the temperature, I guess. Down more. FCSP Vino Box. What is your favourite summit camp in Scotland? Begins with an F. I'm not saying it. Fish of you. Yeah, a vagin. <laughs> yeah, a vagin's stunning. The, the views, the effort to get there, so yeah. A vagin every day of the week. I bet Kevin will, would agree as well. So yeah, what about you? I think Maoli She. Like the, the Corbett in the end of Blanco. It's really nice. Your, you see the locks, you see all the stuff around. I, I really enjoy that. And usually That's people don't down, go... That's one fuller down, that's sort of tucked away. Aye, but by the corner before the Glencoe Visitor Centre, you just yeah. walk always. And it's a fairly long walk to get there, so usually... I never saw anyone there. Yeah, it's, it's pretty nice. Probably now we see there people, but I don't think so. It's quite a hike to get there. Yeah, most people do the Monroe, but not the Corbett. School the really next door. Generally, Corbett's are the better choice. Sorry, Always quiet. Um, my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we, Kevin Russell, he chimed in with favourite tin of mackerel for the famous wraps and what's your favourite Corbett so far? So, Stripey, you go first. Um, as I'm not doing the mackerel wrap because I don't want to, um, to claim me anything, I really like to get invited by Robin and Kev for that. So I don't know favorite tin of mackerel at all, but my favorite Corbett is Maolishi. Cool, I'll take that. For the mackerel wrap, uh, when we stayed in the secret house, just by chance we had four different brands. We had, well, supermarkets. We had Asda, I want to say Tesco, Aldi and Lidl. Aldi won, hands down. Okay. I'm sure Kevin will agree with that. Uh, as for the favorite Corbett, Ben Arihar, the one that camp, camped on with Kevin. She got the views over to, begins with an F. <laughs> Leave me alone, man. <laughs> okay, moving on. <laughs> um, Gaza Explorer <laughs> asks, your thoughts on no overnight parking, if you have ever turned up for a camping trip and see no overnight parking where you want to park your car? A lot of parking, huh? Do you know what? We are seeing more parking charges creep in. And I think the no overnight signs are for motorhomes and maybe travellers to sort of stop them. I don't think they're enforceable, but there's a caveat to that. If you are in a council car park, which, for example, would be the one in Arakar for doing the cobbler, 
that's run by Argyll and Butte Council and if you ignored the signs you could end up with a parking ticket. But physically, the only people that can clamp your car in Scotland is the DVLA. And if I'm wrong, eh, please do comment on the comment section below, but I'm sure that's the case. So I think in most cases, you can ignore these signs, but I could be wrong. Eh, so don't quote me on that, Gav. Yeah, sorry, Gaz. And he also asked about the Pentlands. I've not been there since moving to Fife. But again, I think these ticket machines, they're not run by the council. It's more like a donation. So I think you'd be all right leaving your car overnight. And I think if you were worried, you can actually, I've seen people buy two tickets. So you, you buy one ticket for the first day, then you buy a second ticket for obviously the day you're coming back. And what people do is they sort of write the day, the next again day, put the two tickets in the screen. So well, Yeah, but, but it's no overnight parking. Two tickets wouldn't solve the problem. Or... No, but I suppose you're, you're given <laughs> two donations. So you, it's, it's a great area, but... I think I would ignore these signs, to be honest, depending on the car park. I'm a German, there's no parking, then there's no parking overnight, and then I go just somewhere else, or I just walk in where I want to go and park, where I'm allowed to park. I suppose if you, <laughs> just to finish off on that, if you avoid the honeypot areas, chances are you'll be fine, you'll find a lay-by or a small car park. I park just somewhere else yeah. and just walk a mile or two miles yeah. or whatever. It's, it's always the honeypot areas that tend to charge, so avoid the honeypots. Ah, so you don't need to be. Oh yeah, so Big Al4969 says, if you could do one last big hike, what would it be and why? Um, it's probably not the biggest hike, but it was my first proper hike without my parents. This was a Chesa Plana with 2,964, um, which I did with Georg. Um, and this is basically, then we always went out um, in the mountains together or how I developed with the love of it at this time. When I was like um, 17, I started really late, going out by myself in the hills. Um, and I would do the cycle again. It's like, where it started, there's where it needs to finish. <laughs> but you said? Me? I would probably go to the Himalayas and do a big proper trekking mountain trek. Okay. Something like Mira Peak. Just because if it's your last one, you may as well go out and see the highest there is to, there is to see. Uh, I wouldn't do Everest, but I think Mira Peak gives you that cracking view. So yeah, definitely something in the Himalayas. <laughs> Crazy. Um, is Robin, uh, sorry, um, Rain Rollet ask, is Robin going to try one of Stripey Spaghetti Balls? Nah, you bumped me. I had a freeze dry meal tonight. Maybe in a buffet you could rustle me up some spag ball. Yeah, I, I could. I could offer this to him. I think we can manage this. Um, I do just another one, yeah. And Bon Pecheur, sorry for pronunciation, yeah. Um, <laughs> 4565, do you think you have more subscribers than Stripey because you don't always wear a Stripey hat? This is an interesting question, Rob. Yeah, in yes, <laughs> definitely because I just wear a nice plain black hat rather than a Stripey hat. Mm. Yep. Yeah. It's killing your channel, mate. It's alright, it's alright. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Greg Outdoors asked um, or mentioned. It would be nice to see you guys swapping tents since he always uses the same one and you never used it before. Anyway, cool collab. Cheers, mate. So swapping tents? No. Nah. I like my tent. Um, I like the space and the reason is why I'm using it all the time is because I'm pretty happy with it. There's no need. Um, and I also don't, honestly, I don't have the money yeah, to buy myself every week a new tent. Yeah, tents are pretty pricey, so I'm pretty glad that I have one, which I'm happy with. And maybe I would get a different tent if this one would break, but there's no need to buy a new tent just to buy a new tent. Yeah. No, but I suppose we could swap for the night, but it'd be a bit no. of a bum deal for I, you I, I, because you've got a scarf anyway, so I, it wouldn't be anything different. But uh, you get a bit possessive over your tents, don't you? No. Yeah. They cost a lot and you look after them and... Ah, this, you don't share certain things in life. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sheviot62 asks, Do you ever get down to the southern uplands or Sheviots? Sheviots? How do you Cheviots. Cheviots. So that's the mountain range that sort of straddles the English-Scottish border. And you can tackle it. Most people go from the English side. There. What was that? By, by Dumfries and Galloway down there, even further. No, south. it's over the further, further to the east. Ah, so okay. you come in. That's then now roughly in which direction? Yeah, uh, I've not. Me and Kevin have done a little bit there, and now Kevin's moved down the borders. Me and Kevin spoke about it, 
just something that would be easy to reach mm. if the Highlands were looking a bit rubbish weather-wise. So, yeah, I wouldn't rule out going to the Cheviots, and I've done bits and bobs in the Southern Uplands as well, but my heart's in the Highlands, to be honest. But, yeah, I wouldn't rule it out. Would you travel down? Uh, my parents-in-law live close to the, to the border. Where about? Um, by Castle Douglas, near Castle Douglas, right. Kukubri, down there in this direction. Um, so it wouldn't be too far off, but... You can't um, get to the Southern Uplands through there. No, but when I, when I drive down there, it's because I want to spend the time with them. Yeah. Mm. It's, so I don't think that it would really happen because it's before I drive like two or three hours um, down in this direction, I would always rather go um, north. But you never know, maybe at some time. <laughs> right, here's a joke one. So, Hanamal73 asked, Will you spoon if it's Baltic or prefer to shiver one's timbers alone? Asking for Greg. Greg's this is... the chap you've met, by the way. Oh, okay. No, this is actually not... Um, I, I can answer that because I was um, with a friend of mine, with Martin, at the Bernkopf in the Alps. It's not was winter as well, it was really cold and my isometrist burst, the, not burst, the valve wasn't working. So I was trying to lay all my rucksack and all that stuff and by the end of the day we were on a regular M um, rest, like the self-inflating one, not the fancy x light or something, yeah? And um, yeah, we were basically both laying on, so what is it, 52 centimeters. Yeah, yeah. So we were basically spooning because I was shivering, we had like minus six, minus seven degrees and there was no way. So if it's life or death, you would? I did. Yeah, <laughs> obviously, but going forward, you would do it again then. <laughs> um, before I'm too cold, like the penguins doing it as well. Yeah. I would do it. You know I'm comfortable with my sexuality. As long as, no, I, I leave my trousers on, it's all good. <laughs> um, okay. Another joke one. Andrew Galacher, do you think it's, <laughs> it's by design that men have nipples or just a random meaningless, meaningless but Untimely, pointless coincidence. Jeez, oh, what for words? It's by design, isn't it? Because you could, you could be a woman, but then you go down the man route and become a man. So the nipples are there just in case. I don't know. I don't understand really the question because half of the words I don't know, and um, I have no opinion on that. Okay, so Andrew Kingdom asked, good question by the way. What's your favourite boffy? You go first, JP. I haven't seen many yet, yeah, but I think my favorite bossy um, was so far the Minach bossy. Um, just because I like it, it's, it's fairly small, you have a nice wooden thing, and I was there when the weather was good. Usually I'm in bossy when the weather is rubbish. Um, but there was sunshine, was the wind, yeah, but the wind was from the, from the rear, from the house, so I was sitting just in the sun, I could see everything moving and it was nice and warm. Yeah, cool. I, I like this. Boffy, that. I'll go for Uag's Boffy, which is on the Apple Cross Peninsula, and I took my missus there for her birthday, but before anybody says anything, we did have a hotel booked in the Apple Cross for the first two nights, and then the last night we went to the Boffy. We got it to ourselves, we got some firewood from the hotel, we had deer right up at the window, just grazing away, and she lived that, she loves wildlife. Uh, it was just, just a really beautiful night, it's a cracking boffy, so hmm. you should get yourself up there. Yeah, maybe at some point. Um, Monty Outdoors asks, favourite title for a YouTube video? Favourite title? One that's intriguing and ticks all the boxes what's in the video without being too clickbait. I don't know why I asked that because we had a disagreement on Facebook about clickbait titles because it winds me up a little bit. So that's why he's asked that. Yeah. <laughs> the favorite title for a YouTube video for me is the title which is in this particular situation when I want to watch a video is appealing to me. Yeah. I maybe the favorite the perfect title today is not the perfect title tomorrow. I don't know. It really depends what I'm looking for. Mm. Yeah, and sometimes you actually might undersell your video, but you made a really good video and it might just not do as well and it could just be down. Ah, they the are title. all concerns which yeah. I am not, um, yeah, it's like nonsense question. Okay, um, Stevie Wallace, hey, is it related to you, Stevie? Yeah, it's my uncle. Ah, um, he asked, does Ripey race up to a hill summit and lay down a towel on the cairn asking for a friend? <laughs> 
Yeah, I can only answer for a friend, sorry. Yes, Germans do that. Yeah, but I beat, <laughs> I beat you too the last time I put my Scotland flag down. <laughs> yeah. Tunnel. Moving on, John Crawshaw asked, favourite area for wild camping worldwide and United Kingdom? Stripes? Scotland. Yeah, but Hands down, what I've seen, Scotland. Can you narrow it down a bit in Scotland though? Highlands. <laughs> <laughs> Which island? <laughs> no, I think um, just purely where I live right now, I live in the area of Glasgow, Glencoe, because it's easy accessible. Yeah. So this is the reason I like the, the bigger mountains more, or the look of the mountains in the door, I like it more than in the Rocha Alps. Not that they're better or anything, but I like the look of them more. So for me, it's Glencoe, it's my favorite area. It's Mines a, begins with a, not an F, a C, Cairn Gorms. Cairn Gorms. Yeah, it's just, for me, similar to going co, I can get to the Cairn Gorms in about two and a half hours. It's beautiful. And it's vast, <coughs> sorry, mm -hmm. it's vast and there's so much to do and see. You can go low level, you can go high, there's buffets. It's, it's just, the biggest national park on in the UK. Exactly. Um, it's stunning. So for me, yeah, definitely the Cairn Gorms. Uh, worldwide, I can't, I've never really... Well camped anywhere else other than Wales, but that's in part of the UK. I've done one in England. Uh, you've obviously got a bit more experience abroad than me. Yeah, what is it? Worldwide, it's... I can't narrow it down, yeah, really, to, to worldwide. It's like, I mean... I like quite Austria. I'm not too keen in France or Switzerland. Uh, Germany is generally don't have any wild camping. Yeah, you have only emergency shelter in the in the mountains above three thousand meters. So in a BV bag, you are fine in a tent. No, and it's all the yeah it depends on the rules. No, it's yeah. it's it's just difficult. Um, you Germans like rules, don't you? I'm not sure if we like them, but we have them and we follow them. Yeah, well, us Brits we break <laughs> them. Wait, <laughs> right, no no parking overnight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I would just no parks overnight. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a well, sign. Yeah, I, whatever. <laughs> um, Ewan Smith asks, how are you getting on with the Durstin? The Durstin? It's early days. But, so but, why are you not using the Durstin? Why is the Ultra? That's my summer tent. Oh. <laughs> and it's for when <laughs> yeah, I'm doing... the summer tent. So when I'm, yeah, the summer tent. <laughs> it's when I'm doing bigger race. <laughs> I want something lighter and more compact, so... <laughs> It's, summer yeah. tent, yeah. it's early days, but so far so good. I really like it. It's, um, pitch is easy, the space is decent for a one man, a lot of vestibule space, and it does all right in the wind as well. So we'll see how I get on with it next year, though, for a more informed opinion. So, uh, Charlie Barley, he asked, Will you start a range of stripy hats? Where do you buy them from currently, or does someone make them? We love them. I think you, this could be a side hustle for you. Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, I have only one wife um, and she would let me know if I ask her for 20 stripy hats. So this is um, a unique thing. Um, but thank you very much that you um, like them. But um, no, they're not for sale and they, I don't future see them in the, in the future for sale <laughs> because my wife would tell me. <laughs> sure it is. Okay. Andrew Flynn asks, I want to ask how stripy hats how many stripy what? hats has stripy has is that what for is that a, a tongue twister um i have one and i have stripy socks and i also have wool for two more stripy hats at the time when i bought it and this is like when was the picture i sent you recently and we camped up there from 2010 or something i never knew in 2013 uh, uh, 2021 oh no no no, no. no the one the up there. Yeah, oh, 2010. Yeah. The schooner, uh, no, um, the one on the Unachiga, mm -hmm. schooner Finney, I think it was pronounced. I, I, yeah. I, I anyway, yeah, 2010, you had your stripey hat on. Aye, so. So you've got two in backup? Did you no, say? just the wool. It's a, oh, bam it's a bamboo wool, which is really soft and antibacterial and things, yeah. you know. So it's homemade? It's a one yeah, yeah, it's homemade. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's homemade. Cool. Um, so last but not least, well, for the questions on my channel anyway. Paul Flanagan asked, what's your plans for 2024? Any long distance trails planned? Yes, indeed, there are some long, longer distance. I mean, what is a long distance? But yes, there are something planned and um, hopefully it all works out and then yeah. um, we will see it. Is that the on one that hopefully be yes. yoga again? Yeah. Aye. 
We don't want to give too much away yet, do we? No, no. It, it, hopefully it all works out, but then yeah. people will see. Yeah, exactly. Aye. But can we just say it's not in Scotland? It's not in Scotland, no, it's not in Scotland. Yeah, we'll leave it that way. Um, because we have seen here everything. <laughs> true. And I'm not. For me, yeah, well, I'm hoping to team up with Stripey next year for a big hike. And other than that, I'm going to... I'm stopping doing the Corbett's this year because basically all the Corbett's I need are north of the Great Glen, so it's good to be back on the Munro's. But uh, as soon as spring arrives, I'll be doing the Corbett's as well. Okay, so we'll have a quick break and then we'll go into the next batch. Right, folks, if the camera angle is just very slightly different, we've had a pee break, a battery change, and then we're ready for round two. So it's freezing cold. Oh, oh, yeah, hurry up and let's get back in the tent. Okay, um, hi, Stripey, a question for you both. What's the strangest thing you have witnessed while camping, walking out in the hills? Cheers, Wolfie. What's the strangest thing I've witnessed? Pretty easy for me. <laughs> For me, it was a supernatural experience. Um, Do you believe in supernatural things? Undecided. undecided. I take it you're black and white and don't. No, I'm not. Well, <laughs> I'd done a camp. It was my first ever solo well camp on Ben Alder, and I was quite apprehensive. Uh, so I'd done the walk, cycled in, left the bike at Cool Rub off here. Yeah, the one that's got his best off now. But anyways... To try and cut a long story short, I pitched up at the summit and um, had my meal, went to sleep later on and then during the night I woke up with a loud bang noise uh, which scared the shit out of me and then I went back to sleep and then I had a nightmare that the gamekeeper opened my tent with a double barrel shotgun and blew my head off. Right, <laughs> so, it doesn't sound that bad but it wasn't until I got home um, I'd done a trip report, it was pre-YouTube days, I used to post trip reports on uh, Scottish Hills and I told people about the dream and the bang noise. So somebody posted up, well, somebody committed suicide on the summit and they shot themselves. Hmm. So that just sort of freaked me out even more. And uh, what I'll do is I'll put a link, there's a really good article in The Guardian for back in the day. It was a French guy, he came over on the ferry to Dover, sold his car in London and with the proceeds of the sale of the car, he jumped on a train, I think it was a Caledonian sleeper, took it all the way to uh, Career Station, got off there, or did he get off in Darwin? I think it was Career, and he had this sort of old pistol that shoots the lead pellets, mm -hmm. and he, he walked up and... Like an airgun type of thing. What was that? Like an airgun type of thing. No, I think like sort of old-fashioned type of, I don't know. But anyway... The ballistics report came back because his family thought he was murdered, but the ballistics report showed the, um, you know, the gunpowder was very close by. So they were saying that he, they reckoned that he leaned into the gun and shot himself in the chest. And for somebody to have murdered him, they would have had to have been floating over the crags. If you'd been up on Ben Alder, there's like a set of crags just around the summit. So uh, that just sort of freaked him out. And whether it's connected or not, it's another story. But there you go. It was when we walked up the Zugspitze, highest mountain in Germany, with the we are the Höllental. Yeah, it's like you walk through the Höllental, climb and everything. Anyway, there is a you need to cross a glacier first up, and there's a Via Ferrata, and there came us a guy down with a white beard to here, and he was just naked. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he had just crampons on and boots, and he was completely naked, and he came down over oh, the glacier yeah. and everything. I don't know if he creamed everything, here, <laughs> but no, just a naked hiker. How cold was it? Um, it was summertime, but still, I, I think it was 70 or so. Yeah, because you're what, 3,000 metres in Germany, the highest? Um, 2,963, I think, Not or 64. Off, yeah. Yeah. But this is around 2,000 metres. But anyway, it just, you get there up, yeah, and there comes yeah. just a naked old man <laughs> with a long white beard. <laughs> was it the naked rambler for um, England? <laughs> <laughs> Can you and Robin talk about your experience oh. with lightning on sorry, the hills? Yeah. Sorry, Ever sorry. had to abandon a high camp and hurry for lower ground? Lightning. Um, yeah, I was doing Ben Louis. Uh, we went around the back and the heavens opened up and then we heard a couple of rumbles and my friend says to me, no, we'll just carry on up to the summit, I went, well, no, that's the worst place you could go. He goes, well, we'll see what happens. So 
I put your trekking pole up yeah. on the summit. So I stupidly agreed to begin with, and we, we kept going up, and the, the thunder and lightning was getting louder and louder to the point I think it was just in the next glen to the south from Ben Louis. And by this point, the rain was biblical, and we, hadn't, we didn't even put waterproofs on at that point. He was like, No, we'll go up to the summit. I'm like, no, this is it. You, you don't go up to summits when there's thunder and lightning. And we, we just, I've never came off a mountain so quick in all my life. And then we got down. You, know, you have to go through a commercial woodland that sort of relaxed a little bit then. But soaked to the bone. But uh, yeah, I tend, if there's thunder and lightning, it's the only one thing you can't really control. With avalanche, you can sort of risk assess. Yeah, I think with thunder and lightning, yeah. when, you, when you can see the lightning, you don't hear the thunder. It's like yeah. 18 kilometers away or so because the uh, thunder gets swallowed by the distance. And it happens more in the Alps, does it not? Yeah, in summer. Yeah. Um, I got caught once in summer and there's not really much what you can do. You try to get down, but when the when you have the lightning, the sun immediately is, at least this is what I learned in the German Alp Association, is that you try to get on your backpack or something dry. Your partner needs to be further away, away yeah. with the trekking poles and just make yourself That's so you're going tiny. To, you're going to the brace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're not, you're not trying to run down the hill anymore. You just... That's it. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, if the thunder, hope for the best. If the thunderstorm's on top of you, then you can't run. Aye. You're not going to outrun it. For us, it was in the next climb coming towards us. Yeah, I know. Then you try to get down. Yeah, There's no excuse. Just yeah. down, down, down. It does frighten me, though, because, like, like I said, if it's in the forecast, that's fine. But if it sort of takes you by surprise... It, yeah, when it takes you by surprise, yeah. yeah, it's like... Yeah, so now we're on Malice Jellies. Yes. Another one? Yeah, that's Why, what why that does this one has two? He asked one on your your channel, one on mine. Okay. Um, this is counting. So you, I'll do this one again. Uh, right, yeah. So he really likes the idea of the Q&A and he's, like he says, he's posted one of mine, blah, blah, blah. But he has one more question <laughs> for you both. What do you think of people who camp in 80 miles per hour winds? I'm assuming he means there because he's forgot. Um, I think that a lot of people don't know how quick 80 miles per hour winds are yeah it's like um, the best comparison is with noise yeah noise goes exponentially up with the decibel and i think this is with the wind speeds as well and when any person was already in the hills and saw winds um it's just nonsense in my, 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 my honestly this is just nonsense. Yeah, well, when, I, when i read like 60 miles 80 miles 100 miles per hour wind then people are standing and the tent is doing this this, this is just a lie yeah it's just it a like lie a as, like... as simple as this you don't walk when when you have 60 miles in your rear you it pushes you yeah. you don't control it you go the direction the wind pushes you this is just a complete nonsense i know I think it's like a fisherman when you see how big was the fish you caught. It's like, oh, it's that oh, size. A whale. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's the same. It's just nonsense. For some YouTubers, it's like 80 mile per hour. Like you say, you can't stand in that. It pushes you. Oh. And sometimes it can lift you off your feet. That's what I've experienced. And it's scary. I've been down on my hands yeah. and knees crawling up to a summit. I think, what am I doing here? And to think to pitch a tent in that? Hmm. Hey Stripey, I would like to know since when do you live in Scotland and do you think it will last forever? By the way, I'm also German. Hello? Um, and I regret that I didn't take the step. I miss Scotland every single day. Sad smiley. Um, ooh, I, I lived before actually in, in Scotland for a while. I came over for my masters um, from 2007 to 11. And now we came over from, from Canada and the pandemic. Um, so... Duh, duh, duh. But your wife's Scottish? Yes, she is. She is Scottish, yeah. yeah. So, um, will it last forever? I don't know. I mean, right now we have no plan um, to move somewhere else, but um, I can't plan so far ahead. Um, but, but I really like it here, I see. No, no need to go in particular, no, no, no and with, this, with child and everything, you know, you don't want to drag him out of the friends and everything, but I, I don't know what happens in the future. Um, I usually don't even know what happens tomorrow, you know. No. Can your boy speak German? <laughs> yes, All right, cool. of course. Brilliant. No, it's, it's, you don't learn it, I think, easier. It's, it's every so often difficult, but I, at home I just speak German. Yeah. With both of them, with oh, my right. wife and the boy. Do you know what will happen though? You'll get to high school and they'll say that you're learning French. Oh, because if he... <laughs> <laughs> Aye, probably, probably. 
Uh, what's the coldest temperature you have had to endure whilst well camping? And that's user NN2CR2JU9R. <laughs> I quite like your name. Um, <laughs> for me, it was, I think, minus 16 or minus 17 um, back in Germany by the, uh, in the region of the Wilder Kaiser. And, but we were three people in a tent and it was... Um, my equipment was not rated for the temperatures and it was miserable. It was a night where you could hardly sleep and you were just waiting till you are allowed to walk again. And we never made it to any peaks or anything. We just, as soon as it was bright enough, everything, we just turned back and walked back to the car. It, it killed the whole tour. It was just, we were not equipped for the temperatures. If you're cold, you're miserable. Yeah, you can't yeah. sleep, you're just frozen. It's no. like you're shivering. It's no fun. No, it's horrible. For me, I'm not a, an uber cold well camper. I do want to delve into colder temperatures, but uh, for me, it's probably just like minus five or minus six a night like tonight. Uh, I need to get a better sleeping bag. Ironically, my three sleeping bags all go down to minus six, which is a bit of a nuisance. So I think one has to go and then get something a bit better. Well, they're good sleeping bags, but just something a bit colder. Yeah, you have a good yeah. cosy night tonight, I guess. <laughs> yeah, as soon as I've got the PhD fellow with me, so it should be fine. <laughs> 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 okay, um, Deck Camp um, 5072 asks, do you use a lot of annual leave for your camping trips or are you able to fit them in before and after work days? Thanks. For me, I'm a weekend warrior, so I don't use too much annual leave. Occasionally I'll take a long one, like a long weekend, take the Friday and the Monday off and therefore like the trips up further up north. Um, and if I'm doing a no, I've done many long distance trails, but obviously yeah, then I would dip into manual leave with the wife's permission. Well, my car anyway. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm the same. I'm not using any of my annual leave. Annual leave is reserved for family. Um, so, but again, yeah, when something comes up with permission, then yes, um, it's possible. But so far not. Maybe, uh, hopefully in the future. Okay, so Ian Tupman Outdoors asks, how many times have you gone to do gone out to do a vlog and then for whatever reason have thought I can't be bored? I know I have. <clears throat> yeah, several times, but usually I have this already when I'm in the car and I don't feel it, and then I'm just not doing it. It's it's a lot of trips when I don't film. I I'm not really planning always to film something, and sometimes I plan. I want to film something because something new is something worth yeah. showing. I think, but. Um, there are plenty of videos I have where it was at the second time because it's the first time I had no motivation to film it. I you just lost it. it. You still done the hike, but yeah, yeah, I did walk, the hike yeah. and everything, but I had no motivation to film it. There's no no need to film it. Um, yeah, for me, I've only sacked not that many. It's usually when I'm in company and I've been just enjoying the chat. Mm. I've just forgot to film. And you just yeah. thought, you know what? I'm not going to bother filming this one. Yes, I think it's also nice just um, enjoying the moment and not yeah. not filming. I think filming. It depends how you do it, but it can ruin a lot of the atmosphere. Um, yeah, it is different when, when we're both filming because we are in a process we're used to it. But when you when you're out with friends, which are not filming at all or don't want yeah. to be shown on video, it, it kills it completely because you're getting you don't up. Don't want to be doing the walk thing. Yeah, it's like da, da, da. Brian Ferris six eight seven asks, which is your favorite borsi and why, and what are the benefits of Tyvek in camping or in a borsi? Well, we've touched on the favourite boffies already, Aye. so we'll, we'll move on to the Tyvek. Um, it's probably belts and braces, because I always think you're going to get a splinter that's going to bust your mat. Oh, it's just protection. Yeah, it's it against it the dirt, it's about the, the protection. There's all, all the wooden, wooden floors, all the sleeping platforms. You don't know if you get a stick in it and ruin something. It's just... Um, a protection and when outside, when I use it for example, today I use it as well, um, camping here, it's just, I have a tent without a floor, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, today is fine because every, the ground is completely frozen, but generally I still like, like a clean area which is more or less dry, so it's like a a tent floor for the poor. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> yeah. And it's this... cheap as chips, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it costs. I, I got mine it's actually from a friend. They're doing um, an extension to the house, and I just got like, what was it? I think 3.7 3. by 4. something. Yeah. I got plenty of material, so. It's weird because I bought 
some from the Backpacking Light website, and it's like a crisp packet. But then I got stuff off the roof because my uncle is a builder, and it's like silent. And you can work with it. Yeah, mine was crispy as well, but um, I, I read online you couldn't put it in the washing machine, but this right. is complete nonsense. Yeah. I, I just, no, I just took it and wrung it out like a wet towel and everything. You don't need to waste the energy for washing. I think I, this is what I did and it, it works fine. But yeah, this is the reason exactly as Robin says. Cool. So hi Stripey, sorry from John Donald 8615. <laughs> hi Stripey, really enjoy your vlogs. Thank Where you. are the best wild camping areas in Germany and how do they compare to Scotland? And the best tent to go to get into lightweight camping, what's your real name or is it a secret? Um, thank you very much. What are the best wild camping areas in Germany? Um, I would say on top of the Purzelgrad by the Mindelheimer Klettersteig, which is like a Via Ferrata by by Mindelheim, I think it's really, it's, it's absolutely outstanding looking over the valley. Um, how does it compare to Scotland here? I don't know, I don't really compare anymore, I stopped comparing things. It's, I think, makes you kind of unhappy when you always compare. And it's different, isn't it? It's just different, yeah. you can't compare Scotland with, with Germany. I mean, we have no midges, we have so we have less ticks not everything wants to eat you when you're outside we have less winds <laughs> we have warm less rain <laughs> no but it's it's Rinsics just different. Color, to be sure. um, the best tent to get into lightweight camping it really depends what you want to do yeah it's like um, what the conditions are where you're from for example when i was in the alps i built my own tent yeah um for for camping and in Scotland I really enjoy the Duomit yeah but it has it really depends what you want to do I think a really good tent is a Lanshan yeah when when you look for sheltered spots to camp good, it's good beginner's is, tent yeah yeah what, what is a beginner's tent I don't know um, when I go out with my son it's a good tent it's just a norm it's a, it's a good tent yeah it's, it's a cheap tent it's a good tent you can seam seal it it's when you don't have two left hands it's a German phrase you say it in Scotland as well two left hands no. When you are really not talented with handy things, but seam sealing a tent is is really simple. I yeah. think a everyone can do that. Oh, easy! Right? If you just get no. a little brush to loop. No, I think the Lanshan too is a, is a brilliant tent, and it's not just for beginners; it's for everyone. I would say the update Lanshan one because it's the same uh, yeah, length as a pro, yeah, but, but you get an inner. I like my space. Yeah, you have. You have more space in the two, but it's not but, as. But in the pro, you there. have a door. No, no beasts are coming in. It's just a single wall, but I'm a single wall person. So yeah, that's because you've come. <laughs> you come from Germany. <laughs> no, also here I think, but it's a different topic, yeah. Yeah. Also, it's a story. A lot of questions. Um, Folk love the stripy hat. I, I, I guess. Yeah. yeah. The story is, I bought. I, I said it before earlier. We um, it's a bamboo wool, and my wife and me we went in Germany to the Bavarian weight competition for the heaviest pumpkin um, and this is where they sold the wool and this is where we bought the wool so this is a story of the stripy head wool and the head is just my wife did it because i need a head it's because i get cold ears when it's fresh winds <laughs> Planning on a trip for the Highlands this February. Any recommendations for guides or any informative book to get advice, etc. Looking to do an overnight on a Borsi, 15 to 20 kilometers round trip. Thanks for all the amazing videos. So the recommendations, <laughs> I'm not sure about guides because I wouldn't use a guide myself. Um, unless it was Sky, of course. But an informative book, controversial as it may seem, because it upset a lot of people, would be the Buffy Bible. No. Yeah, it's a cracking book. And I'm not going into too much detail, but the reason it's controversial is a lot of people were upset because it's a charitable organisation. A lot of volunteers put a lot of work into keeping these places watertight and habitable. And then the guy came in the back of it, wrote a book, and they got money off what people feel off the back of their work. And I kind of get that. Um, and it caused a lot of friction. And membership is really cheap. And even when you don't want to do a membership, you can just donate some money. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like... Um, but yeah, the, the Buffy Bible is good. Go on to the NBA website. It lists every every Buffy available. Um, with regards to the distance, I mean, 
Just, just use goals. a map, just have a map yeah. and look at the map and plan it as, yeah. as difficult to give advice because um, Robin or neither me, we, we don't know what you walk or how much elevation gain and all that stuff and even then it's it's best to plan a route by yourself, I'm, I'm yeah. honest, yeah. But there's plenty of areas where you can get a couple of boffies and like just over there at the back of the Glencoe you've got, uh, you know, Career Station. There's three mm -hmm. or four boffies in there. Uh, Cairn Gorms are littered with boffies. So, yeah, like Stripe says, just study the map, get planning. If you're unsure, I mean, jump on one of the videos and drop a comment in or message us on Instagram. So, Bon Percure... So, uh, he is, I think, from Quebec. Four, five, six... But yeah, that's right, yeah. Uh, six, five. He has two <laughs> questions as well. How do you deal with people always talking about your favourite outdoor dish, the pasta bolognese? Bon appetit. Yeah, it's good. Um, I like it as well, and I like to talk about it, so I'm really happy when people like it. You need something as well, like, I say super boss, I've got the macro wrap, so people ask about that. You've got your... I, I yeah, yeah, maybe at some time. Um, Dave Goodman, 1956, asks, what's your proper first name, Stripey? As I just keep calling you Stripey and your head's home. And are your heads homemade? Um, <laughs> how is the cone coming along? Um, Robin, how many Monroes? Okay, there's several questions. Um, why do everyone, does everyone think I have multiple heads? Is it because I, I mean, I wash them on a regular base. Um, I would lie them. if I would say if I wash them every, after every single trip. No, it's not smelly, or is he? I'm only joking. <laughs> <laughs> I've not got that close. <laughs> yeah, um, how is the cone coming along? Yeah, you you might have seen it today when I did a, a coffee that I used not the cone and the pot because uh, the latest cone I did is actually by a manufacturer to dial in everything for laser cutting. So this is getting along. Sounds good. Um, yeah, when you want to hear all the misery, I live with the cone. Um, yeah, I have the Patreon where you can look at it, sorry for that. But I will still keep you updated, or Robin will keep you updated, what happens on this front. Um, and Robin, how many Monroes um, to go before before you have done them twice? And how proud do you feel to have achieved that? Okay, okay. 10 so centimeters taller, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> so today, um, at this very present moment, Stripey and I are camped on Bucolative Beak which is in Glencoe, and we've came down the ridge a bit, so we're just sort of above the road, and... Stopka Bar, I think it's called. Yeah. yeah. Had even a name. It has got a name, yeah, and there's a little cairn just behind <laughs> oh, us. Yeah. Uh, so, I've done... The one just behind us is at Stop Curry Ranach. I've done that one already, yeah. but the one at the back, I'd only done Stop once. Doop. That was 118, Stop Do. So I'm on 118, I think, and how proud do I feel to have achieved that? I'm assuming you mean the first round, which uh, I was over the moon when I completed the Munros. I uh, got a big turnout from a completion party. Never got the greatest weather, but that tends to happen with these completion things because you plan ahead and you're stuck with the, the date and the weather that you're given. But yeah, if I was to pick the Munros or Hibs winning the cup, they're probably on an even par. Do you ever finish when you have around five or so? I'll not get, no get in there in five <laughs> rounds. Absolutely not. Maybe, I'm not even saying I'll get a round two, to be honest, but I just enjoy doing them again, as and when. How did you end up in Scotland? Grüße aus Unterfranken. Um, by plane. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was... Um, yeah. <laughs> we, we lived in, in, in Canada, and it was nothing really for us. So and we didn't want to go really back to Germany, so we thought we, we would give Scotland a try, and this is how I ended up here. And I like it, it's good. So, <laughs> I'm just reading the next one. Andrew Kingdom again. What one person tent would you recommend three seasons? I'm thinking of buying a new one next year when walking across North Korea. Oh, see, I didn't know this is a thing, walking North Korea, is it? No, he's, he's on the wind up. <laughs> see, see if you go to Andrew's, um, go to the comment and click on his thing and watch one of his videos. He looks like the leader. What's his name? King Jong Un. King Jong Un. He looks the double arm. And he, no offense, because he said that to me, and I went on had a look, and he does. Okay. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> I'm not in the wind up. 
<laughs> That's true. So a tent for North Korea, you'd have to be bulletproof. <laughs> yeah, and camouflaged. <laughs> yeah, especially for the border. <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving on swiftly. Uh, PB2125, uh, the best well camp spot in Scotland and in your home country. The best wild camp spot, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> is for me the wild camp where I had the best experience with. Yeah, and my best wild camp spot might be not your best wild camp spot because you had different experiences. It would be easier to answer, I think, which wild camp spot has maybe the best views or, or things like this around. But um, I enjoy really, really every wild camp. Cop out. Most of them, yeah. <laughs> and it, it, it's home country is the same. It's it's, it's difficult. To say. I think in, in Germany I would say probably um, Säuernspitze or Pürzelgrad on top. Um, I think Grubenspitze called. It's You're really, have to really give nice. me these names, by the way, so I can put the writing at the bottom of the screen. Ah, when someone re when someone is really interested in it, <laughs> then they should drop a comment and. Um, <laughs> Okay, I sent you the names. No, this is, is pretty nice. Yeah, so, sorry, you. Okay, so Phil Haddon asked, what jobs have you had and what job do you do now? Yeah, it's plenty of jobs. <laughs> no, it's like, um, what jobs I, I, um, I did like most people in Germany. I worked, um, I worked in the automotive sector and then I swapped the niche and now I'm working in the IT sector. And did you do any YouTube videos well in Germany? No, I did photography. Okay, uh, you want to do this one? Advice for getting my four and eleven year old into hiking and wild camping. And that's from three... Oh sorry, and this is from Three Imaginary Boys, um, 1972. Right, so for me I would say you want to start on small hills, plenty of encouragement, tease them with Haribo, so you can give them rewards, make things interesting, see, look at the map, can they name peaks. Um, but I don't throw them into the deep end, because if you scunner them, that could be them. I think it is a, the, the key to success, or at least from my experience, is that it needs to be interesting. Yeah. I mean, no three-year-old, I was when, when mine was three-year-old, we went up the bookie. Um, okay. And I think the bookie is a nice wee hill um, to, to get up. Yeah, it's like, oh, no, he was four, I think, three, four. I don't even remember even, but it's, it's a lot of hands-on for a wee kid and I think um, kids just like to use their hands, they don't like to walk for 500 meters over a gravel thing yeah. and it's really interesting. See, yeah. for a good example, for me, I'm from Edinburgh and we've got r for seat on our doorstep and my dad took me up there and there's so much interest for kids, so if you had something like that on your doorstep then get them up there. Um, my dad took me up there a lot actually and he actually tricked me though. He told me there was a chip shop at the top of the summit. <laughs> so I'm like marching on it and the disappointment when there was no chip shop. You can only pull that stunt once, so that's the thing. Uh, and I think it's up. also good to start rather sm with smaller things, as you yeah. said, that, that you can go you back. You don't want to uh, them. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, this is actually what happened with my wife when she moved to Germany. We lived in Germany. We went up to the um, Benedictenwand and there's like a, a VFR Rata, but it was winter. <laughs> we had the story before. Um, and she didn't enjoy that, so this is, she's not into mountains anymore after this one tour. And we, were, yeah. we had like snow, it was bitter cold, it was like hands on on a rock. It was was really amazing tour, but only we did one. Was machst du vom Beruf? So what is my job? Yeah, I'm working in the IT sector and doing just IT things. I don't want to really go too deep into it because I think it's um, IT is a vast topic of things and yeah, I just want to keep it for myself. Fair dues. Aye. So that's a wrap with the questions. Aye. So thank you very much from yeah from us yeah, all. That's been good. Uh, don't know how long that's been. Yeah, probably too long for most of yeah. you, but I um, really appreciate it. Yeah, that all was the good. Uh, thanks for the questions, yeah. And uh, I'm freezing now. Aye, time to go box. to bed and yeah. thanks a lot. Yeah, cheers guys. Bye. See you next one.